Hey everyone, it's Jen and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 189, we're going to talk a little bit about why preamps are so important. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And a heads up, our huge summer sale starts in a week. This is the sale in which savvy customers stock up on spares of their favorite tubes at a substantial discount, I may add. If you are a customer of Valves and More, you'll get an email blast next Thursday. And if not, just watch Friday's Tube Lab and we'll give out the sale code then. And um, a pro tip, a lot of our um, larger customers will s stick in the cart all of the premium tubes that are rare and hard to find and then they'll just they'll they'll check out in the first hours of the sale because uh, a lot of those tubes uh, just don't they don't last the week so yeah. anyways. Th thankfully we do have some big orders coming in of some of the premium stuff just before it, the sale starts so uh, we should have some good stock on some great things and next week we will go over some of the um, really great vintage tubes that we still actually have in stock which mm -hmm. is really amazing given how quickly inventory is going down um, all across the board with vintage tubes. But anyways, we've been talking about that. Uh, today, we're talking about preamps. Now, when I was a young wannabe audiophile back in the 1970s, the very first piece of gear I built from a kit was a preamplifier. And compared to what I'd had before, that Heathkit preamp sounded amazing. But what I didn't understand at the time was just how important preamps and preamp tubes are in audio, both pro audio and home audio. In fact, preamps are everywhere you look, in your home system, um, in a studio, um, in your, your tablet, your phone, your computer, you name it. Preamps are just basically everywhere. And after your speakers, they're the most important component in your system. Let's take a look at why that is. Okay, so everyone knows that audio is analog, and this, of course, is the symbol that's used to show an analog signal. And in fact, this is a very simplified one frequency uh, version of what an analog signal really looks like. Someday we should do a scope in which we we show a thousand hertz, one kilohertz, mm -hmm. and what an audio signal may be centered around one kilohertz looks like. Yeah, it's definitely not going to look like a clean sine wave. <laughs> <laughs> no, and in fact, um, uh, an analog audio signal is really a composite of many, many signals. Yep. And um, it looks totally weird <laughs> when you look at it. But you can sort of see it sometimes. So. If analog, if music is analog, then almost all of it is picked up off of microphones. And microphones need preamps. And uh, some microphones have built-in preamps, um, but a lot of them will have external preamps. Many of the preamps are actually dedicated to that particular microphone. And that is probably, that preamp is probably, of all the preamps out there, for all the different purposes, and we'll look at some in a minute, that particular preamp is probably one of the most important. Yeah, so many vocalists uh, get mic'd, uh, instruments get mic'd instead of having direct pickups. Um, yeah, there's microphones everywhere. And if you get this wrong, you get everything afterwards wrong. What about reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders? Oh yeah, um, they've got preamps. Uh, what about your mixing and mastering stage? Yep. What about um, your DAC? Well, yeah, the digital uh, signal that gets converted to analog is an extremely low signal and it's gotta be amplified. So there's at least one gain stage normally. 
Yeah, many DAC chips actually come with an integrated run into them these days. Yeah. And here's our universal phono preamp. And um, anybody who's running vinyl has got at least one preamp stage uh, in their system. What if you've got something like the Wilsonton R8? That's that's a power amp, isn't it? No, it's actually an integrated amp. So it's got a preamplifier stage, which uses the lovely sounding 6SL7 tubes. Mm -hmm. And then it's got a power stage, which uses EL34s, 6550s, KT88s. So, yep, that's a preamp as well. Here's some more um, of our preamps. This is the Universal 6 or 12 SN7. Um, that started basically our kit business years ago now, uh, and it can use the 6SN7, which is becoming, the, the premium vintage 6SN7s are becoming pretty rare now and yep. very expensive. But the 12SN7, which is essentially the same tube with a different filament, is still available. In fact, we still have... Still reasonably available, yeah. Yeah, and we still have... Sylvania bad boys, new old, <laughs> new old stock. <laughs> yeah, and, and decent quantities too. You can't really say that about the, the 6SN or the 6 volt version anymore. Yeah, yeah, so that's great. We also have an E80CC preamp, which is just an amazing, fast, clean, clear preamp. And what about if you've got a headphone amplifier? Yep, a headphone amplifier is very much an integrated amplifier, but on a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. It'll have a power section that's really tuned to driving a set of headphones rather than a set of speakers. Yeah, yeah. So it's got a preamp, but it's also got impedance matching, which is very important with headphones. Yeah. Well, it's important with... With speakers too, with, <laughs> with <yes>. anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the old days, there were a lot of different output impedances from a power stage. Um, so you could see 16 ohm speaker systems and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now we pretty much have settled on a nominal four, six or eight ohms. Yeah. And if you have a six ohm speaker system, most likely you're driving it off the four ohm tap. So um, yeah, so preamps are everywhere. Well, let's just reset this and we'll, we'll take a look at why they're really so important. Okay, so here are um, the sort the source components that we were talking about: that your microphone, your phono preamp, um, tape head preamps. Um, so any uh, any tape device, whether it's a cassette or reel to reel, the uh, signal off of the magnetic tape. That's right. You get a signal off the magnetic tape, just like you would get off of the stylus pickup off of a vinyl record. is very, very low. In fact, it's much lower than even um, uh, you would get off of your cartridge off of a vinyl record. Um, your DAC preamp um, and uh, signal processors inside studios. They're, they're all over the place, and they're going to have preamps as well. So. The signal off of all of these devices is low, really, really low. It's, me it's typically measured in millivolts. A millivolt is one thousandth of a volt. Okay, now this is why these devices are so darn important. The preamp gain stages of these devices needs to get, in most cases, there's always exceptions, so please don't jump into the comments with the exceptions. Well, you can share them, but yeah, yeah there yeah. are going to be exceptions. Yeah. These preamps all have to take that small amount of signal, analog signal, and bring it up to line voltage. What's line voltage? Well, line voltage is what the main equipment in a studio or in a home system will run on. Mm -hmm. And line voltage is typically 1.0 to 2.0 volts RMS. And you, what happens in a studio environment is you'll establish what your line voltage is. So it might be 1 volt, it might be 1.4, it might be 1.5. We've got uh, some large commercial reel-to-reels in which it's established at 1.4. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different standards. I think they actually go all the way up to 2.2 in, in some cases. Yeah. 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 And uh, some studios, for various reasons, might run at 2.2. 
they might run at 1.8. In the case of um, uh, our, our little developing home studio in which our main um, uh, reel-to-reel decks uh, have a standard line voltage of 1.4 volts RMS, um, we would probably develop all of our stages to um, expect 1.4 volts. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. And that's probably how it happens in a lot of cases is that your principal piece of equipment, whether it's in a home studio or a professional commercial studio, will determine what the rest of the voltages are going to be normalized at. Now, you don't nearly have to stress too much in home audio because any good piece, any well-designed good piece of audio equipment that you would use is going to expect something from one to two volts RMS and be designed to carry and handle that voltage. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be set up for it already. It'll be flexible and capable of handling it. So you should be fine with whatever piece of home equipment you go with. Yeah, that's right. So for example, our our universal phono preamp outputs just shy of one volt RMS. And uh, almost any preamp ever made uh, will be perfectly happy receiving a control preamp, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your next stage. Uh, would be perfectly happy with one volt RMS. But it also should have been designed to be able to cope with something a little less than one volt and certainly should be able to cope with two volts RMS. Generally, it's okay to go a bit under. You just don't want to go over the maximum. Yeah, and you don't want you don't want that that boosting preamp to come in too low because what happens is if you end up with let's say 0.2 volts RMS into your main system, you've got to amplify that. Yeah, and if and if that picks up some noise at that low gain stage and you amplify it again, it's going to amplify all that noise. Yeah. yeah. So the preamp tubes that we use in our system, if you have a, a preamplifier and you should to handle bringing these low signals up are in my estimation are the most important tubes in your entire system. Mm -hmm. We're often asked, uh, what tube is important in this integrated amplifier? Well, it's normally your first input tube. Start with the preamp tube. Start with the preamp tube. Now, everything, everything, everything in audio, that's supposed to be quotes, but it doesn't look like quotes. <laughs> it looks like an upside down finger. Anyways, you know what I mean. Everything in auto, audio matters if you're really concerned about the final um, sound that you're going to achieve. And unfortunately in studios, particularly today, but it's been going on forever basically, a lot of people don't really pay any attention. They just think, oh, well, it's good enough. Um, and we have a saying, when we do uh, auditioning of um, anything to do with audio, but particularly with source material, it only takes one person who cares to make a great sound or a great product. Yeah, it can be with anything. Yeah. Yeah, and that leads me into a fun little heads up. Charles and I are developing a new preamp, and you might say, you've got two great preamps. What would you need a third one for? Well, one of the problems with our uh, traditional line of preamps is that they're fairly expensive, and they're, they're not for beginners to assemble. Yeah, they're not super challenging to build, but they're also not really easy. Yeah, so we had a bunch of criteria, and we're going to actually start talking about the development of this preamp a little bit more in the future. But the very first thing is it needs to be affordable. Mm -hmm. It needs to be easier to build. It still needs to look sexy. And most importantly, it still has to sound amazing. I was going to say fantastic. <laughs> well, either one works. Yeah, so... We're in listening tests with an early prototype version of it. Charles is actually going to build the the first proper dedicated prototype probably later today. Yeah, yeah. Today, tomorrow, hopefully I'll have it up and running early next week. And from that, of course, we'll do a production prototype. And um, we're hoping we're hoping what we'll have is a preamp that everybody can afford. And 
You might think, well, there's lots of preamps out there, Jim, and there's lots of cheap ones from China. Um, why do I need something that you guys develop? Well, most equipment that shows up today in the marketplace, particularly affordable equipment, is essentially just cut and paste copies of old gear. And not even well-designed old gear in, in many cases. Um, and no engineering applied. In fact, I get emails every once in a while from manufacturers who would like to take one of our open source uh, schematics and modify it for a different tube and have us do the design work for them because <laughs> they don't have a clue or not enough of a clue to design stuff themselves and they don't, nobody wants to pay engineering. Yeah, and, and that's not how we work. We spend hours upon hours testing and revising and listening to every one of our amplifiers to get them just right. Yeah, I think uh, next week when we start talking more about the, the, the prototype design, we'll talk a little bit about the design decisions because there's mm -hmm. literally thousands of them. Yep. And because there's two designers in, in this business, um, we bounce things back and forth. So it can be kind of fun, though every once in a while one of us gets hurt a little bit, I think. <laughs> we sometimes butt heads on it, but <laughs> you know, it makes for a better product whenever you have somebody to challenge you on something and, uh, and suggest other options. Yeah, so that's coming up and the big sale is coming up next week. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, Charles, you've got a few tubes that came in. Yeah, okay, so let's clear the deck and go take a look at them. Yeah. So we were just talking about preamps and what do we got that came in? Um, We've got some of the most common preamp tubes ever made, the yeah. 6SN7. Yeah, yeah, these are some great tubes. Um, it's harder, it's getting harder to find the new old stock GE 6SN7s. Here's the, well, let's get that the right way up. Right way up. Here's a, a box for this guy right here. And these are one of our favorite 6SN7s ever made. They're just, Rock solid, reliable, they make excellent cathode followers, but they're also great voltage gain stages too. And we've been able to find a few more of these new old stock, although it's getting harder and harder. And this is actually a, an even rarer version of the tube. Oh, it's a top filament. It's a top filament. So when you lamp this, maybe I should have set this up on camera, but when you lamp this, this has an absolutely beautiful glow across this top filament well, let's, right here. Let's pause and come back and lamp it. Yeah. That'll be fun. Okay, well, we've got it hooked up to our bench power supply here, running at 6.3 volts on pins 7 and 8. Sorry, we've darkened the room a little bit here. There well, we go. we've turned all the lights off, and especially the studio light. And, and there's your top filament bridge. Yeah, isn't that nice looking? Now, sonically, as far as we can tell, it has absolutely no effect. It's yeah. just simply the cool effect. Yeah, we don't know why they were made this way. It was probably from a specific factory, and this is just how they did their filaments. You don't see them too often. Um, just flip it up there. Yeah. There. You can Let's see it head on. That's kind of fun. Anyways, they're rare. I would say what... Um, Ah, there we go. <laughs> I would say, what, one in a hundred, one in two hundred tubes had the filament bridge, maybe even one in three hundred, four hundred. They're not, they're really not common. Yeah. Um, but they're, uh, they're lovely. You know, I often listen, especially in the winter, I, I'll have an evening concert and I'll be listening um, mostly in the dark and uh, watching my tubes. And uh, yeah, it's just just fun. And this is also a feature that you see a lot on the GE 6CG7 and 6GU7 9-pin versions of this tube as well. They have a little filament bridge. Yeah, they um, don't lamp up nearly as brightly. Well, they, they've got big top getters, so that kind of covers it up a little bit, right. but they do have a nice glow to them. Not quite as nice as this, but still pretty nice. Okay, what else did you find this week, Charles? Okay, well, another one of our favorites, and for many of the same reasons as the GE 6SN7, here we have a Photon, uh, is it 6N8S, or...? I think so, but yeah. it's a direct equivalent to the 6SN7 GTB, and this is the early first-generation Photon, so it has a bottom foil getter. Charles, can you see if you can get... Yeah, let you me can, see if I can get that on camera. You can see it. There we go. See that reflecting in the background there? Yeah, a foil getter is just basically normally a rectangular plate of gettering material. And when it's flashed off, the material just flashes off onto, instead of the top, 
it flashes off onto the bottom of the glass, or what I call the waste. Yeah, and that was commonly used in a lot of earlier tubes. Uh, later ones would use um, sort of a shaped wire instead of a, a plate or a piece of foil. Now, uh, there's a very common later version of this photon um, that uses the more common uh, Soviet saucer getter. It just looks like a flying saucer upside down, basically. And uh, you see that almost everywhere with Soviet era tubes and even with modern uh, Russian uh, uh, tubes and uh, reproduction tubes. And w with the photons, that next generation, like so many tubes, um, in particular vintage tubes, the later generations don't sound as good as the early. And in the case of the photon, we we don't carry the later generation and at they're all. They're also far less reliable. They're not as tight testing. They're more prone to noise. Uh, but these guys are rock solid. They're really nice. They're fantastic. And it, we found a, a partial mixed case of them uh, that were all from the early 1960s. So we've got some more of them back in stock. Yeah. And we always try to date match if we can. I mean, we... Tr we try first we electrically show them the electrical label yeah, Charles. there we go so there's the two sections because it's a twin triode so 102 and 100 out of 100 percent is essentially an exact match but if you want to be technical it's it's within two percent uh five percent or less is we consider a perfect match with older harder to find tubes a mutual conductance or gm number that is within 10 percent is acceptable but it's much better to work with um, with 5% or better. Because if your sections aren't matched, depending on your circuit topology, there's a very good likelihood that your volume will be unbalanced left to right. Mm -hmm. It does depend on the circuit, though. So if you have both gain stages uh, in series with each other, then you have to have the sections matched across the tubes instead of in the tube. But uh, in some amps, you'll have one channel per section, in which case you really need to have them as tightly matched as you can. Yeah, I mean, if you've, if you've got um, any kind of a preamp or amplifier in which you have one tube of a type, so just, mm -hmm. let's say V1 is a 6SN7, um, and that's it, uh, or a 12AX7 or a 12AU7, um, then it's almost, and it's a stereo amplifier or a stereo preamplifier or a stereo sound processor of some kind or a stereo DAC. <laughs> it almost, don't spin it so fast, you're making me dizzy, Charles. <laughs> um, it almost certainly is um, one stage uh, per channel, in which case what Charles said holds. You've got to, this would be a perfect tube for uh, a single tube application. But if we were looking for a match, we'd be looking for something around 102 and around 100 um, and somewhere within 5% if possible. So we'll, we'll do the mutual conductance matching first and then we'll do um, the, the label uh, cosmetic matching uh, second. And along with that, if we have date coded tubes, we try to incorporate a, a date match as well. But inventories of quality vintage tubes are just falling so rapidly. I would say by the month we're watching. It's amazing seeing how, how much the supply side is dropping. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this. I started talking about this years ago that it was coming. And now that we're living through the decline of inventories, it's really hard to see and take. Luckily though, we have a very large extant inventory. And what that means is that not only are many tubes still available in our inventory, but the pricing is priced at what we we costed them at last year, two years ago, four years ago, um, if it's an old inventory item. And that's probably going to start changing with our competitors. We're going to try to hold our old pricing as long as we can. It's only when we bring in new inventory and our wholesalers raise the prices. Then um, we have to do the same. Then we have to do the same. Yeah. Well, okay. if you've... Oh, you've got some more tubes. Uh, well, I'm going to show off one more. I'm just going to bring it on the camera here. In my search through our current inventory to see what else we have that, that is really of interest, I found some absolutely beautiful 
RCA gray glass 6SL7s. Ah, with the silver label. Yes, now the 6SN7 version of this tube is much more famous and, and sought after as a preamp tube, but these are also um, highly prized, especially by um, uh, guitar players as a high gain uh, early stage preamp, uh, just like we were talking about earlier. And RCA is known for having a very rich and and um, what Just, would you call it? A, a great rich mid range. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of ways that people have described this over the years. They might call it a full sounding tube or mm -hmm. a full mid range. Um, rich and warm is a terminology that we use a lot in our descriptions of tubes because I think you get it right away. A rich warm sound. Once yep. you've heard it, <laughs> you know what it is. If it's if it's your thing, you know if you like to listen to the old crooners, um, if if you don't like an edgy, highly detailed system, you probably like a warmer sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of vintage tubes were essentially designed and tuned for that warmer sound. And there's no way that it happened by accident. Companies yeah. like Sylvania. <laughs> RCA. It's almost like they tried to keep all their tubes sounding the same across the uh, across yep. the generations. Yeah. yeah. So we have a, a a small number of these tested. They're in the store. Um, I believe we have some more hiding somewhere that I'm going to try and dig up. But they are great sounding 6SL7s, and they were a joy to clear and test. Okay. Well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. There's a secret code that a lot of people have been grabbing. That's pretty easy to figure out. And we can reach almost everybody around the world with flat rate $20 shipping. And if yours is $150 or more after the discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. Enjoy, hopefully, some nice summer weather. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>